Uh, this year, again, we have Natalie Castell Castellini uh, moderating the panel for us, fortunately, from the Philadelphia Business Journal. The panel this year, last year we did, uh, uh, for those of you guys who are here, we did product type diversity. This year we decided to do, and, and last year the focus was kind of on how did you weather through it. You know, we've kind of gotten through that and we're hopefully on the uptake, right? Maybe. Thumbs up. He's drinking. He doesn't give thumbs up. That concerns me. There it is. Uh, so this year we, we celebrate. We, we, he is celebrating right. something. We're going to find out probably by the end. We have Mike Hare, who's with Puccini Paul in the far end there. Mike is the uh, senior vice president in charge of development for Puccini Paul. Before that, he worked for uh, the River, Riverfront Development uh, Corporation down in Delaware. I think appointed by Governor Carper to that position. So he's been born and bred in Delaware, Archmere, St. Joe's guy, um, familiar with familiar with that area and uh, been really working in development and doing a pretty good job with Puccini. Been with them since 2008. Yeah. Um, right, uh, good, yeah, good, good time, time to go to the private sector. Time. It was good time. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That tells you how much I know about real estate. Than 2000. <laughs> <laughs> in 2006, you would have been looking for a job in 2007. You're right. The, uh, Eli Kahn, uh, you know, E, you, you brought up, you broke off, I guess, in did Econ 94, maybe, something yeah. like that, right? And. Uh, Obviously, it was with Jack Lowe, charge of marketing, leasing, and stuff like that ahead of that. And uh, Eli, you've got maybe $5 million, five million, five point five million feet under development, and uh, we're, we're under management, and then maybe another six hundred thousand feet or so multi-use development going on. So, uh, fairly big player in Philadelphia suburbs. You know, very creative, multi-use, um, <coughs> doing transit development right now. Uh, Next, we've got Jim Harbaugh. Jim is uh, Jim actually is the only one I'll say that probably didn't come from development. He was with Bristol Myers Squibb in charge of their real estate, the director of the real estate group with them. <clears throat> he left them and went to work for City Center in Lehigh Valley in 2011. And uh, I think that when uh, hopefully he'll touch on some of what they're doing up there. They created a. That's uh, why I'm here. That's why you're here. <laughs> They're the plug. He, they created a thing called a NIS up there, which is really kind of unique and, and different. Um, and I don't know if it exists anywhere else in, in the state right now. I, I don't think it does. And uh, it really is something unique and special. They <clears throat> helped the uh, the government create this, and it's really brought back Center City downtown dramatically. And then, of course, we have. Jeff Devon is with Brandy I really trust. It's the whole for the year. Right here. Yeah, right here. <laughs> he was on the far end of that picture. <clears throat> but anyway, the uh, Jeff is uh, in charge of the Philadelphia district for Brandy Wine or the Pennsylvania district for Brandy Wine Realty and uh, Executive Vice President, Senior Managing Director. So means nothing. Means nothing. Lease space, that's all I know. Right? When, there's space. A problem, when there's that's a problem, it. Jerry goes, what the hell happened? That's right. Everybody so, needs a fall guy. That's right. So, uh, <laughs> hope you guys enjoy it. Learn a little bit of something from it. Um, with that, Natalie, if you want to take over and get, get a little bit more detail with these guys, that'd be great. <clears throat> thank you very much, Eric. And thank you, developers. I appreciate it. We're running a little late, so I'm going to, dip, if it's okay, dip into some of the um, cocktail hour after six, but not too much. It's That's the number start. one rule that you never break. No, don't okay, dip so let's hour, talk so that. So, all right, what I'm going to uh, start out with, in, 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 in light of our time constraints, if we could go down the row and maybe everybody can talk about a project or two. I know you've got multiple projects, but some of the more significant one or two projects that you're working on that give people a flavor of the type of uh, work that you're doing. And Mike, go ahead, we'll start with you. Sure, I'd say the majority of our work, uh, well, we have uh, really two platforms focused on in our company. Uh, right now in Wilmington, it's largely infill uh, multifamily development uh, in the city, in, center, in the central business district. Uh, our hotel portfolio, which is kind of based out of our DC office, uh, we currently have uh, five hotels under construction, Portland, Oregon, Washington, D.C., two in New York City, and two in Delaware. So uh, that's what's happening. Uh, I'm doing a big office redevelopment for uh, St. Gobain, uh, the biggest project I've ever done. It's taken an old uh, 
275,000 square foot 1969 vintage office campus in Malvern, and we leased it on a 20-year lease to St. Gobain Corp. And we're doing a $60 million renovation of that into their North American uh, headquarters. Uh, exciting project. And I just broke ground a few months ago on a 205-unit uh, infill project in downtown Westchester, uh, apartment project, uh, five-story building, two levels of underground parking. So those are the two, two kind of local projects that I'm involved in. Uh, so in Allentown, there's about $650 million in the ground right now. We're about 420 of that at City Center. We've, in the last 24 months, uh, built and filled two Class A office buildings totaling about a half a million feet. We're going to open a renaissance by Marriott Hotel as part of the PPL Center Arena that's been <coughs> opened. The hotel will open in January. Under construction on a third Class A office building, <coughs> excuse me, about 170,000 feet. Uh, we have 170 apartments above uh, 40,000 square feet of retail going up. We've had a very good response to those. Uh, and we'll be announcing another office building here in the next month or two when we have the ability to announce the tenant. So uh, Allentown, there's a lot going on in Allentown. Jim, tell them real quick, tell them how many, how many uh, deposits <coughs> you've had or interest in the... Uh, yeah, we, we took 74 deposits in the first six weeks on our downtown apartment complex in, in downtown Allentown. Uh, so the demand has, has already got us thinking about where we're going to put our second apartment complex. Downtown Allentown. <clears throat> Come see it. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess this is the commercial portion of our meeting, so we'll, we'll try and be brief. Uh, Brandywine has about a <coughs> billion dollars worth of development right around now. I won't really touch on too many specific <coughs> projects, but they're based locally in Philadelphia where the dominant share is down around uh, 30 Street Station, University City, the continuation of the Sears Center project. Uh, Austin, Texas is a market that we're very excited about and uh, Jerry's committed a lot of time and energy for, and then also in the district. Uh, but I think what's probably different about us than maybe people have probably envisioned a few years ago was they're all not just office building projects. We don't, so the, you know, a lot of stuff that Eli's doing and and everybody at Puccini and, and across the board, it's mixed use, and that's where you've got to go if you want to get your customer interested in your project. So we've expanded beyond our normal boundaries and JV with a lot of different people to try and create an atmosphere. Uh, well, let's hit on that. Why do you uh -oh. need to do that? But you're going back. Use? To, yeah. To my, yeah. What's that? Why do you need to do mixed use to attract your customer? Why? Why is that a necessary component? I think everybody's read all the information and seen what's out there. I mean, uh, uh, the hype of live, work, play is a reality. I mean, I still think it's probably from, uh, it's more of a Wall Street cachet that everybody uh, hears and that's drilled into the uh, investment community more than it is a Main Street reality. But I think there is some likes to it. But our, our customers are demanding uh, the ability to live their lives uh, in one location and take care of all their needs rather than simply get in a car and drive somewhere else. And I think, you know, Eli's been conquering that in, in Westchester since the beginning and, and that's kind of picked up and played out. If you're doing it in Allentown. Sure. I, I was telling Jim, my sister lives in Warfield just outside of Allentown. His so brother in law is our years. banker. There you go. <laughs> <It turns out. laughs> One of them. I know him as a brother in law. I don't know if he's a good banker or not, but <laughs> nice uh, he man. sounds like he made a wise choice by putting some money in your credit line. So, uh, and, and they're, look, they're empty nesters, and for the first time, they're considering where to go and what to do, and Allentown is a legitimate topic of discussion. Whereas three years ago, five years ago, that probably wasn't an, uh, a real <coughs> high priority. Absolutely not. Do you know, we could probably spend the whole night talking about the neighborhood. Okay. Zone, but, and the, since we can't, go ahead and give the audience a quick overview on what it is. I know it's gonna give Jeff some ideas of what we <laughs> when the KOZ expires, <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, the, the you've been talking to Glenn too much. <laughs> but the, the I think you described the um, this this zone as t a TIF tax increment financing on steroids. So the, yeah, the audience sense. know what it is and how it's helped you. Well, it was a hard fought, but it's a thirty year legislation, <clears throat> and what it permits is for any developer who's going to make a substantial capital investment to take the any state or local tax that's not otherwise legislatively committed 
An example of that would be liquid fuels tax, which goes to build roads in Pennsylvania. So any state or local tax not otherwise committed go, gets paid by the tenant as it ordinarily would, goes through Harrisburg, once a year it gets qualified, goes through Treasury and goes directly back to the Allentown Authority, who sends our share of that to our bank to pay down our debt. So if you move into one of our buildings as a tenant, <clears throat> whether you're a restaurant paying sales tax and liquor tax, or you're a tenant, an office tenant, any taxes that you pay to the state or local government, go back to pay down our debt, and we look at it as rent. So we have the ability to write down rents considerably. We have the ability to deliver space built out because we capture the taxes to do it. The one extremely smart thing they did is they ignored real estate taxes and that they left them so <laughs> sovereign to the municipality. So as we build new buildings and millions of new dollars, millions and millions of new dollars of rateables go on to the books of Allentown. The school district benefits and it needs to. The city benefits, the county benefits from all the new rateables. So that's the incentive. We're developing, at this moment, we are not considering developing out of a 40-acre zone in the downtown part of Allentown because it's too robust for us to move elsewhere. So that's our only project is the urban core of Allentown. Jim, would any of your development or the development underway be happening without this zone in place? No. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. The driver was the, the creation of the legislation initially to fund the construction of the arena. Mm -hmm. But some smart people got together and said, well, why wouldn't we build an office building, some retail, and a hotel with the arena mm -hmm. and take advantage of the rest of the zone and rebuild the city? But without it, I, I, it's fair to say that very little would be would be coming out of the ground. Can development happen without government subsidies? It seems like it. It, it, it depends on the uh, the state. Okay. I mean, like it's a simple it's a simple rule of thumb. If you want less of something, tax it. So if you want people to smoke less, you tax a carton of cigarettes. You to drive less, tax a gallon of gas. Uh, uh, Texas, where we're in Austin, um, has 200 people a day moving to Austin. It's a completely different tax model where you don't have corporate business taxes or personal income tax, you have real estate taxes. It sounds kind of funny to hear developers say that the right model is probably for us to pay more real estate taxes, which is fine. Um, it's just it, it just emphasizes the importance of not necessarily the aggregate amount of taxes, but the, the, the process and the method for the tax policy. It's it's a very it's a very important model that uh, cities and states need to be aware of and Allentown, University City over at Sierra Center, the Navy Yard are all great examples that effective tax policy and, and, and we'll say out loud that KOZ is not the best form of tax policy. I mean that's that's spot tax policy that isn't uh, appropriate. What you should be doing is working on the big picture and we spend more time on that. But it emphasizes that uh, 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 if you structure it the right way, people will come. I want to hit on, we started talking about it, what's driving your development activity. Eli, you mentioned your Sango Band deal. Um, so that's a case like, as of a tenant looking for new yeah. space and, and, and you've got your Westchester place. So let's, let's talk about some of the drivers of your development. I'll, I'll repeat what Jeff just said. And it's customer driven. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not rocket science we're doing. You have to listen to the customer. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I've tried to spend my career listening <coughs> to what the market and the street is saying. At the end of the day, you have to respond. You have to be ahead of the curve to respond to customer needs. Um, all of the mixed use infill multifamily that everyone here is doing is a response to the customer. Um, you know, the, the, suburban office market that's moving into the city, Wilmington, Philadelphia, we, we, we built a couple buildings in, in downtown Westchester, office buildings with no parking, office buildings with zero parking that we're leasing and getting some of the biggest rents in Chester County because we're following the, you know, the demand that our customers are telling us about. So it's really kind of that simple. It's just listen to what the street's saying and you'll find a business model. <coughs> uh, I think well, I think we're uh, 
trying to create that market. I think uh, maybe uh, more aspirational in Wilmington's uh, circumstance where we've had a strong corporate community. Uh, typically, the streets have always rolled up at 5 o'clock. It was a DuPont-driven culture forever uh, than the large banks. Uh, we have seen now employment come back to Wilmington at pre-recession levels and go beyond that. But you all know from the office world that uh, now it's eight people per thousand and uh, they're lined up at the men's room every day. So, which is good for the apartment business, bad for the office business. So the market driver is, you have to be in the mixed use world. And uh, the fact is, so that's it's good for, this is our, you know, uh, like everybody else in the area, how do you get into Philadelphia? You know, which comes back to the, can you do it without subsidy? Union pricing, the rent's only here. You know, if you're downtown, where there's Northern Liberties, you know what those challenges are. In Wilmington, the rent is fixed. You can't accomplish it without a subsidy. And uh, what do you, what is the tipping point to get to that critical mass where people feel comfortable? You know, the riverfront, IMAX theater, movie theater, the mini golf course, the public skating rink is coming in. So you're getting there, but it's a, it's a long, hard fight to get there because uh, I was mentioning to several people uh, during the cocktail hour that uh, so many people, young people locally who grew up in Wilmington may still be working in Wilmington, but they want to live in Philly for the vibe, yeah. or they want to live in Westchester. So that's that's where we're having, that's the trouble and the uh, challenge that we have. Yeah. Well, the, the demographics are shifting. It's uh, uh, the stat that we've taken away is that, if I get it correctly, 33 out of every 100 millennials are going to live in an urban area or a town center. And by 2025, 75% of the workforce are going to be millennials. And that's just a different demographic, as you was saying. So now your customer is basically saying, I need to appeal to that employee base so that I attract them. And I think that's driving all our decisions. We, we, we couldn't survive, but we couldn't survive uh, bringing an office tenant without a parking lot available mm -hmm. in Wilmington, where you could, maybe in Westchester, we, we couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's part of the uh, the hidden tax for an employer coming here. You know, you're, are you going to absorb that uh, or not to make the deal happen in the city? One of the um, issues that, can, whether you're in office or multifamily, that, that seems to be merging continually is providing amenities to your customer. And it seems with each project, the amenities get more and more incredible. Talk about some of the, the conversations and amenities that either you have incorporated or have considered, or you're thinking like, oh my God, that's two way out there, but you it's know. It's crazy. Well, let's go to Eli. It's crazy. I mean, I just done a multi, this Westchester project, I mean, the lobby is, the lobby's you know, 10,000 square feet with, it's going to look like a boutique New York hotel. I mean, it's going to have, I mean, the, I can't, I mean, the money we're spending on this lobby is, blows and me How away. much are you spending on that it, lobby? It's, it's, I mean, we're spending, you know, two and a half million dollars on, I mean, finishes and just making it, and we studied, you know, we went from D.C. to New York looking at what's hot, and in the multifamily sector, you want to be, again, ahead of the curve. And because our target is really the empty nester who's, and the young professional. But the young professional, they'll move in and be happy. The empty nester who's selling the two and a half, or the four bedroom, two and a half bath colonial, and, and moving back into their little <coughs> urban, you know, this isn't Philadelphia, it's Westchester. Mm -hmm. They want security and they want to walk in the door and be blown away. And they have the money to, to spend on the rent, and that's what they're looking for. But it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, and, and on the office front, you're seeing these common areas now, the cafeterias and all, in order to attract the tenants. It's something I, I never dreamed that we'd be taking 10% of the you know gross floor area and devoting it to, you know, collaborations. Yeah, yeah. Cafes that no one's going to have coffee at or what have you, but it seems to be it seems to be a requirement. I don't know. The question is: Is a cycle or a trend? Right? It's the question. That, that's the question. Is it a cycle or a trend? Yeah. Mike, how about in your buildings in Allentown? Are you finding uh, have well, they reached this point now? <laughs> no, we haven't quite got there yet. But um, I mean, we're planning each of our buildings with a retail component on the first floor, and we're looking at them purely as an amenity. We put several restaurants in. Uh, we've put everything in from a you know a Tony Luke's to a very upscale white t 
Table Club kind of restaurant. Uh, we're very lucky that our first major tenant, Lehigh Valley Health Network, who's the largest employer, they're just growing like crazy, came downtown with an orthopedics program, put a two-story fitness center right into the second and third floor of the building, which is available to all of our tenants, corporate fitness, corporate wellness, physical therapy, hot stones on your back with music playing, you know, what, whatever you want. I need Besides, that. You do it? <laughs> I'm talented. So, I mean, we're, we're cognizant that we're, we're kind of starting over. Mm -hmm. in Allentown. So we're we're looking at the live, work, play and having to think about each one of those components every time we do something. And again, we're building a hell of a lot of parking because <clears throat> we don't have a mass transit. Well, I know Evo and some of the... Well, it, it, well I, I was going to say is, I mean, it, it, you were in charge of real estate for Bristol, right? So 10 years ago, when you were out <coughs> looking for sites for your customer base, mm -hmm. amenities was kind of like the last item on the checklist and it really wasn't a real topic of conversation I think the way we describe it is uh, uh, it's now a priority so the amenity checklist is not just at the bottom of the, the, the paper that you need to respond to it's closer to the top and they actually read it and it's important to them. whether or not they use it is as a different uh, situation I don't think that's been fully vetted through yet as a lot of these uh, amenity packages that you used to think as retail space was a profit center for you, and it's Absolutely. not. Absolutely. You basically have to take your <coughs> basis in that vacant space right. and add it to the top yeah, number of floors in your building because you're really not going to get, at least we haven't, a great return on a lot of that retail. It's a, it's a lost leader for us, uh, and it's ironic because when you do any of the suburban town center projects, every every township in America that's, you know, put the residential over the retail, you know, because that's what we want. Like, oh my God, you know, it's just, it's a burden mm -hmm. on projects. And it's a challenge. I was thinking of what you were talking about when uh, we go through the same analysis about the amenity package and how do you make it cool and hip because you're competing against the project that's gone up, you know, down the street from you. <coughs> uh, and uh, it, the research around uh, amenities, people, what people want versus what they use. In the hotel world, 83 percent of people want to want to pull in the hotel, and three percent of the customers use it. You know, that's kind of the, you know. So you got to have it, and uh, it's got to be in the brochure and the website. That's right. Yeah. So. How would you all describe? You all have different pockets of the universe. Your local economy has shown strength, and there any signs of weakness, faltering, might cost anything. I would say if uh, you looked at the economy, a real estate economy as a two hump camel, uh, we're halfway up the first hump. So, I mean, I think it's uh, uh, it's still a little bit sluggish. I think the fundamentals are scary, but uh, what? because uh, we're so heavily reliant on large employers. You know, we don't have a real entrepreneurial economy. Uh, you know, as long as J.P. Morgan and Jamie Dimon still love Delaware, that's good for business. Uh, you know, our major uh, health care provider, Christiana Care, continues to explode. They've invested $200 plus million dollars in the city of Wilmington in the last year. That, that's all good, but uh, blue collar jobs, all those things are still in question. Uh, we still have a major school issue. We've had forced busing for 35 years, and uh, the challenge that has to attract talent and families and economies. But uh, as I mentioned, in the city, uh, we're at uh, pre recession employment levels, so there's cause for optimism, but you know, still a good fight. You know, most of my stuff is in Chester County. And, uh, I got to Chester County by going to school in Westchester and, and stayed. And by just sheer dumb luck, I mean, it's an incredible marketplace. It's got diversity. It's uh, people love to live there. Uh, employers love to be there. So, I mean, yeah. I think you know, I, I grew up in Allentown. So, I mean, in, in a time when it's it like was home week, yeah. it was uh, <laughs> it was not a good place to live. And uh, so, I mean, in terms of cyclical, I, mean, I couldn't be in a better spot. Jim, I know you mentioned the health system's long game. Well, yeah, I think I think our project obviously has relied on this neighborhood improvement zone. But the good news is that Lehigh Valley in general, which is the third largest SMA in in Pennsylvania and Allentown, the third largest city. But Allentown has relied on the success of the Lehigh Valley, which has done very well. It hasn't done very well from an office headquarter perspective but it's been off the charts on distribution and fulfillment and big box work. And so the Lehigh Valley is no stranger to people 
and our challenge has been introducing a new product in it. And we're starting to get the RFPs from New Jersey. We're starting to get the RFPs from out of state for 150, 200,000 square foot offers users. We're not getting them all, mm -hmm. but, but the fact that Allentown is getting the RFPs is quite, a, quite good news for us. Especially New Jersey has that word test up there. Yeah. Uh, look, overall, I think just describe it as good. Mm -hmm. It's trending upwards. Um, I think it's a have and have not world. Um, and, and, and I don't want to come off uh, too simplistic with it. We're moving in the right direction. I think there's a lot of things going across the globe and happening in the world and locally that can affect that. So there's a lot of positive momentum, but we're clearly not out of the woods. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it's still a, a, a steady state, but it can turn left or right or drop down at any given time. I think the, the bigger thing that we're seeing is there's a real bifurcation in occupancy levels and different product types. And that's where I think the distinction is, where if you're a, a, a high quality location, which has always been our business, you have a high quality product, it's fully amenitized, you have everything on that checklist, you've all heard it before, the public transportation, the amenities, then you're doing well. And if you're not, and you're a commodity product, you're competing on price, and that's a tough place to be. So um, where we're doing well as a company is in the town center neighborhoods, what we call the Crescent Markets, uh, Radnor, Conchahawk, and Plymouth Meeting, um, then Center City, and those markets where we're more traditional commodity type, suburban type product that weren't fully monetized or don't have the capability those are the ones where we have challenges. And you know that demographic we were talking about earlier, those millennials, the 75% of the employee base is going to be millennials. That's where I think on our side of the table, as Eli said, you gotta listen to your customer. So those employers are trying to figure out how to be attractive to those employees. There's gonna be less of a workforce population than there has been in the last 50 years. And those people, and we're guilty as charged, we raised them all. They're all spoiled rotten, and uh, they want their own room. It's like uh, the Evo project downtown in Center City, seventeen hundred to three thousand dollars a bed, in addition to the tuition check at Penny Tracks. Fascinating, um, but they want what they want, and uh, if you don't supply it, as Eli said, you don't wow them and come in the door. You have to compete on price, and that's a tough position to be in. Uh, not that you can't make money at it, you can, but it's it, there's not a lot of momentum. You're kind of always pushing that ball uphill, so you have to differentiate yourself. You've got three private developers and one public developer. Um, one of the biggest issues during our session was financing. How is financing these days? Jeff, why don't we go ahead and we'll go on down the hey, road. Look, I live an easy life. Okay. <laughs> Bank of Jerry uh, has been pretty good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, in our former, the former life where Jerry was, uh, and, you know, Bill Wilson and some other folks in the audience, we had a private hat, and, uh, you know, I was doing prepackaged bankruptcies, going to the judge every Tuesday saying, yes, they looked at our project. It's a tough, it was a tough environment for a long time, and we looked at it and said, everybody in our business who survived and did 08 and 09 was good at what they do. We had the luxury of access to capital and optionality of private money and public. Uh, it's a real easy way to live. You can make decisions quickly. Um, it, it's it's a much different environment. I will say this, a lot of our people who work with us never had that experience. So they don't know how tough it is to put a deal together the way these guys do it. And uh, I think that I, uh, they got to recognize that everybody today in 2014 versus 2008 or 2003 is much better, faster, stronger than they used to be. Bankers have caught up with the industry. The, P the developers have caught up with how to deal with it. So you guys make it look much easier than it used to be. So it, it's simple for us, but there's so much money out there. It's ridiculous. It's, it's you know, sovereign wealth nations who are really trying to deal with capital preservation decisions, not return mm -hmm. or yield, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah, our our financing is interesting because it's it's two tier. When we have a project we want to build, and it's all demand driven, nothing speculative. We take the project to the Allentown Neighborhood Improvement Zone Development Authority, 
who reviews our financials, reviews the pre-leasing we've done, and then says, yes, we're going to let you use this NIS structure. So we have $235 million worth of NIS permission that we then have to go fill with private financing. So our financing is real financing. Nobody dumps money in our in our backyard. So we have a, a capital stack of about seven banks led by National Penn. Uh, and your Don't brother at QMB. Wake up town national. And, and so, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a two-tier process for us. The good news about it is that we have two ways to support debt. One is rent, and one is, in the case of most of our leases, long-term tax revenues that the bank can say will come through the state and come back to the debt. So it's complex, but it's working. You want to number your there's, projects. There's plenty of money, as Jeff said, out there. I mean, banks are looking to lend money. They want quality projects and they want, you know, for, for me, they want personal signatures. So, I mean, I sign personally on a lot of debt. I have great relationships, fortunately. Got good cash flow. Uh, we're having to dump a lot more cash, a lot more equity into the project because the banks are not allowing us to play the games that we played for decades and decades in terms of, uh, you know, loan to value. Loan to value, that whole term should be really banished from the English language because it's really <laughs> loan to cost. Right. Value is irrelevant to the banking community today, which has put a real stress on cash. So for us, it's either dump more of your own cash into it or find a cash partner and give up equity in your project. But there's plenty of there's plenty of money out there. Well, I think it, it uh, would agree with everything that's been said, that that is certainly not an issue mm -hmm. at all uh, in any of the markets, including Delaware. Uh, the challenge we have is bringing Institutional uh, equity projects in Delaware, the office market, et cetera, for any either new deals or uh, refinancing, just because of the way you know Wall Street views uh, the marketplace. Uh, but certainly for the projects we've done in larger markets, and if it's the quality of the asset, um, it's no challenge. Good finance. I'm going to take a moment. Are there any <coughs> audience questions? Yes, uh, do you have to let him answer? No, yeah. I'm next. That's scary. <laughs> well, I got a couple questions, but. Oh, no. Oh. Would, the, would, the, would the NIS take care of some of Wilmington's problems? And how deep is the residential market in Westchester Borough? So why don't you start with the NIS? Would the NIS take care of Delaware's problems? Seeing as how it's Commonwealth of Pennsylvania legislation, I don't think so. Well, we were once part of Pennsylvania, so it should be. Well, <laughs> could they do what someone did to create your NIS? And well, if you have the political will to create an incentive like this, uh, it's a powerful tool. And, you know, for, for even all of the criticism in the early days that the legislation had, its principal purpose was to uplift the city of Allen. Right. Single, and there will never be another NIS in Pennsylvania, I don't believe. There have already been two crises. But if you're successful. <clears throat> well, they've, they've already looked at the model, amended it, and create a community reinvestment zones. The state, uh, you apply for them, the state is giving two a year, as I understand, at least that was the plan. Right. Right. We're, maybe like we change, we may have a little change in Harrisburg coming up, uh, but <clears throat> I don't think a big enough change to change this. And what those do, one went to Bethlehem, one went to Lancaster, they're a little less robust into what they let you do, but they're recognizing that taxes paid here, used here, I think is a really good model instead of send it to Harrisburg and they'll figure it out. So Wilmington, well Delaware's answer has created a downtown development district uh, and so three counties and each county has the ability to apply for the governor to designate one downtown development improvement zone. Now, I, it may be <coughs> 26 or 30 contiguous acres and at time of application um, that municipality or if it's a town that's uh, applying, identifies key projects. Regrettably, it's administered by the Delaware State Housing Authority, so bureaucracy out the wazoo. It's really targeted towards economic development projects, but to generate redevelopment, really for Wilmington. But uh, you're taking in, in year one $7 million and dividing it uh, between three designated downtown development districts. The legislation was passed uh, last April, funded in July, and the first award 
will be May of 16, sadly. So, you know, the, the state's trying to respond, but we've, we do, we obviously have some assets in Chester, uh, so ex experienced, uh, rightly or wrongly, with the KOZ. We've tried to take some of the Pennsylvania models, the CRIS, et cetera, you know, to our friends in Dover to kind of look at these models to energize some real neighborhood redevelopment. Uh, I think the projects that we would look at in the CBD would, would get accomplished anyway. Um, mm -hmm. you know, come heck or high water, you know, because this, the city wants them, the state wants them to happen. But uh, we've been looking at models like this to really energize uh, real neighborhood revitalization. You've got to be careful to make the distinction, we think, between not a lot, Pennsylvania's had a lot of KOZs. Right. Not everyone has been successful. So, what's that tell you? Your project uh, at, down in Delaware, all those areas <coughs> had, at least from our perspective, strong demand generators. You've got a huge population in Allentown that doesn't want to leave. Pennsylvania has the highest retention of residents of any state in the country to 80%. Allentown's probably way up there. They're living in homes and they need to move. What the what the tax situation did was allow a private developer or public private development to go in and provide a product at a reasonable cost that could appeal to those folks. So it's you know you say what you want about KOZs and, and we wouldn't vote for it as a as a business or as a resident of Pennsylvania to perpetuate that program. You'd want uniform tax policy, but we have a KOZ that expires in 2018. It's the first Sierra building. And we've executed deals at $37 a foot, starting rent, that go well beyond the KOZ. So it's not for everyone, but there's a demand generator between University City, the, 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 the third busiest train station in the country, and just the fact that, let's talk about commutes, people in the suburbs who have to go into the city to hire that employee just don't want to have to go that extra 15 minutes across town. So you can criticize tax policy and, and see where it throws around, but you got to look at each individual project and is there a demand generator out there? And this is just like what Eli said, you just got to build it for them and they will come. You can't, it doesn't create demand. Mm -hmm. The demand's got to already be there. Either. This just allows you to afford a, a, a product. Question? Yeah. How much demand was generated by high energy costs, and, and are we confusing some of the desire to move back into the cities with that? I, I understand the demographic aspect of that, that the people are getting older and they like to live in the town, and they don't want to drive as much, but how much of it is driven by high fuel prices? Because in, in America, whenever there have been low fuel prices, we spread out and build bigger houses, and when the fuel prices go up, we contract and build smaller houses. So I'd like to hear what somebody else would say about that. Is this concentration uh, going to flip back as if, in fact, interest are uh, uh, energy costs are dropping now? I don't think so. Uh, Charlie, I, I, think it's de it's I think the people that are moving into the city, any of these cities, the, the, these are, I, I can't speak for Allentown, but the rents are top of the market rents. I mean, the, you know, what Jeff just said about the Evo project, what, what, what uh, you know, these high, high rise uh, multifamily projects, these are top, top, top dollar rents. Those people could care less what gas prices are, in my opinion, or what the price of the natural gas is to heat their home. This is a paradigm shift in the way we want to live. Kids are out of the house. I heard a stat once that, you know, uh, UL from Urban Land Institute, that you know, 10 years ago, the average person waited, you know, 12 or 13 years before the last kid was out of the house, before they considered selling the, the suburban home to downsize. Now people, I mean, they're literally, the kids are on the, the first day, the last kid out of the house, and the for sale sign goes up, and people are out. So it's just, it's a whole different vibe from the empty nester perspective. They're not saying, oh, my kid's going to come home for Thanksgiving. I need two bedrooms for Johnny and Sally. It's not happening. These people are in their, in their mid-50s and they're saying, the hell with it. I want to be downtown, whether it's downtown Philadelphia or Allentown or Westchester or Wilmington. They just want some kind of a vibe. They're tired of the mini bus or minivan ride for the kids to go to every sporting event and they just want to go out and have fun. They want to party and, and go out and have coffee and breakfast and dinner and drink and, and have a good time. So it's, the millennials don't drive. See, they right. drive bikes, they're yeah. not cars. I, I agree. It's, 
I, I think the <laughs> suburban experience that we've had over the last 50 years is the counter cyclical event. Right. I mean, all throughout history, everybody's lived in cities. You had cheap fuel, cheap roads, and that was kind of an experiment that just didn't really pan out extraordinarily well. So what you're doing is you're migrating back to what people have been doing for since the beginning of times, which is living in denser populations, <laughs> sharing infrastructure, and reducing their costs. And, and like 10 years ago, I was convinced never buy a home or anything unless you're uh, next to a train station because gas I was a big believer in make it five dollars a gallon mm -hmm. force people to consolidate you can't afford the infrastructure these suburban communities have you have three homes on a quarter mile versus 30 homes in a block in center city but I think the difference in that is to be interesting to play out is you got electric cars and cars that drive themselves part of the reason you want to walk in Westchester and have a drink is because you don't want to deal with sure. the consequences if you get caught versus, you know, how do you pick your bar? Uh, all right-hand turns. I'm not making any lefts on the way home. Right? Uh, so it's just part of life. So I, I just think it's we're going back to where people trended for a really long period of time and fuel costs will have some impact, but not on the majority of the people. Yeah, that's statistic. Suburbs, suburbs aren't dead. Children, daycare centers, all that. It's yeah. No, but it's with school districts. Westchester's got a great school district. I'm in East Town Township for that reason. It's, uh, I, we're in the city and we're investing in the city heavily and in urban areas across the country. But don't be mistaken, it's not going to be a completely barren suburban area in between. That statistic I gave out earlier. That's 33 people out of 100 are going to live in a town center or an urban area. That's still 66 people. <laughs> living, <yeah. laughs> you know, if that was an election, else, yeah. they'd lose right. on the other side. So it's, I think it's, you know, the exaggeration of suburban death is is out there. And the schools are a big driver. I mean, I think yeah. they're the driver. I mean, you know, with anybody you talk to lives in the city, they don't want to leave, but they want to educate their children. Right. And they don't want to do it in the Philadelphia public schools. <laughs> And uh, if they don't have another option, then they're, they're coming out. We have that same situation in Delaware. Uh, and we have corporate capital, maybe not as much as we were, but uh, the people that we recruit to work at the large employers, you know, they're, they live in Chadsport, they live in Unionville, you know, if they want to have their children in public school. Any more from the audience? All right, keep the, uh, keep the line tight. Let's go to our predictions, and, and, and we have Delaware up there. First state is for <laughs> Yeah, the first state. Mike, your, for next year, what are your thoughts? Well, I think uh, we see the total development office space kind of flat for some of the reasons I mentioned earlier, is that uh, although we've seen employment growth uh, because of the way uh, stacking is going uh, within uh, the office market, we see no new development of, of office really in our entire market. Uh, occupancy we see going up because uh, as I said, the employment is coming back. Cap One, JP Morgan Chase uh, continue to expand uh, in Delaware. So the office market is decent, especially among the large tenants of the law, it continues to attract people. And we see rental rates as basically flat. Uh, cap rates, occupancy is up, but there's still vacant space. So cap rates, we don't see moving much at all. Industrial. Uh, what I could tell you about industrial space, you could fit in a thimble. Uh, only that uh, my great analysis is when I started in economic development 25 years ago, that's what the rent was for industrial space, and it is today. So, uh, but we see no, no movement there at all. Uh, retail, which we hate, uh, we do see some uh, growth, uh, minimal growth, uh, but uh, in terms of. Uh, throughout the marketplace. And then multifamily, which is where we see the real growth, except for an occupancy, because as uh, there'll be some market adjustment of new product. Do you know how far down, I mean, it's going down, is it going from 95 to 93? Oh, I'd say it's uh, in the low 90s. No, it's still, still healthy. Thank you. Pennsylvania suburbs. Do you want to? I filled this out like I did my SAT. <laughs> <laughs> see, 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 one, two, see. three, one, two. Um, hit, hit on what you want. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, office, I think, suburban office is 
is, is in trouble. And I don't think, you know, on the good side, you're not seeing much new development. Um, you know, take St. Gobain. They're, they're vacating 170,000 feet of buildings, going into a complex that was vacant, so there's absorption, and then we're going to tear down what, they, what they're vacating. So, you know, there's not been a lot of new growth, so I think overall um, it's not horrible. It's not as horrible as it, as it, as it, as it could be. Um, industrial, it's so difficult to build industrial in the suburbs. The land costs are crazy. The improvement costs are ridiculous. I mean, we're building three industrial buildings right now. They're the first three industrial buildings that we've built in probably 10 or 12 years. I mean, I know Greg and, and Charlie just finished building a building in Chester County as well. And it's, it's just, it's really difficult to do. Demand is down, you know, just because we're not in an industrial society. Our older industrial rent, our older industrial product is doing great, but as Mike just said, I, I got in the business in 1986, and industrial rents were four bucks, and they're still four bucks, you know, 30 years later. So, um, retail, you know, uh, shopping center retail, grocery store, and could retail is in trouble in the suburbs. Um, we have two shopping centers with vacant anchors, uh, a vacant Acme and a vacant Safeway and we can't find anybody for it. So we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what the future of those products are. Um, uh, you know, infill retail, experiential retail, like what we're proposing at Waterloo Gardens, those kind of projects, projects centered around mixed use, I think will, are, are clearly on the rise. Uh, Moly family in Chester County, I think there still is a lot of room to grow. Barrier to entry is difficult. Um, but if you have good sites and infill locations, there's still a lot of demand. Lehigh Valley. Yeah, I filled this out very quickly this morning. So um, I apologize for getting in late. I'm trying to remember what I said. Um, <clears throat> as I think about the Lehigh Valley, really, I think about Allentown. I know we're only a piece of it, but in the office side, I know what we're going to be doing over the next couple of years. And we're going to be building a lot of office space because the demand has been high. Uh, the good news is that vacancy rates, even though we are bringing some people in from the suburbs, are staying fairly strong uh, and actually have gone down a little bit. So the valley's doing well from an office perspective. So total's going to go up because we're building it. The next 12 months, we're building it. Occupancy, I think, is going to go up as well. Um, industrial, I'm not sure how much more is going to get built um, you know, from a distribution perspective, it's been crazy over the last number of years in the Lehigh Valley. Um, I think occupancy is going to support itself and maybe go up a little bit. Uh, and I think rents will follow a bit, and therefore values will probably jump a bit. Um, retail, I don't think there's a whole lot more retail. And again, I'm, I'm not a retail guy. I mean, I'm dumb as a bag of hammers when it comes to retail. But I know we're building additional retail. Uh, some of the mall areas are struggling a little bit. We're seeing rational demand downtown for what we're doing and beginning to see rents actually solidifying in a downtown setting. Um, multifamily, again, um, there's going to be more in our, in our market because we're building more. Um, I'm not sure vacancy is going to increase. I think it's going to be absorbed from what we're seeing. Uh, values, I think, are going to stay fairly steady, and uh, you know, cap rates isn't my universe, so I kind of went flat on all of that as we go across the board. But uh, thank you, Jeff. Center City. Well, Eric was nice and filled out half of the ones that I didn't fill in. So, um, all right. So, what do we got here? So, he office did, he, wise, he didn't offer me that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I, you know, what do I know about certain things? Um, so uh, total development, I think, is flatline. Uh, the cost of construction is well beyond what you can buy a building for. Philadelphia and Detroit are the only two cities in this uh, United States that trade below replacement cost. Uh, for the first time in our lives, though, I think that's actually a data point that people are not customarily dismissing. So I think, you know, as far as predictions go, a year or two from now, we might be caught up with the rest of the country and actually have that is a real substantive conversation for all the points that Eli raised, which is just the cost of, of, of building. So uh, uh, growth in the last 12 months, that really means absorption, I think, and that's clearly going to be up. Uh, employment's up. Uh, 
right or wrong, we kind of calculate it as a 1% change in employment equals about 400,000 square feet of absorption in the city and 500,000 square feet in the suburbs. So if you're betting that that's going up by whatever percent, you can kind of gauge it. Um, but the best thing that's happening to us is the fact that we're not overbuilding again. Um, that's just clearly a supply and demand metric that's starting to go our way from the ownership. So that means occupancy goes up, <laughs> rental rates go up, sale prices we think go up. Cap rates, out of my pay grade, 7.3 is a high figure. Again, the, the, the CBRE event I was at last night talking about the uh, volume of capital out there and the bid lists have completely different names than they used to a year ago, six months ago, three years ago. So that seems like it's going down. Industrial, um, Mike, I, I started in this business in industrial and uh, I, I, I worked for Peter. And uh, it's about the only smart decision I ever made was get out of that industry side <laughs> of the Peter. business. You know? <laughs> no, not Peter, but the, industry, <laughs> the industrial side. It's not hard to figure out. 4% of a $4 rent is a lot less than 4% commission on a $30 rent. So um, uh, there's just not much on it. In the city, I think what's interesting is you're not going to see the big manufacturers. You just can't compete. Uh, PIDC has been trying for years, and it's just a very competitive environment, and the union issues are out there. But I think what you will see is probably a lot more of this smaller industrial manufacturing to go with a lot of the trends with the millennials who are you know, farm to table concepts or there's apps that are out there and there's infrastructure that needs to be supported. So you'll see more production in the city than you will than you have in the past, but it'll be very different than I think what we're all used to. The question would be what the volume will be. Um, I couldn't tell you whether or not it's going to be absorption or not, but it, it, rates just have to go up from scarcity if employment goes up. Uh, cap rates seem to be silly at this point, so I can't imagine they go down, but uh, they might. Um, retail, I think, is trending upwards on everything, with the exception of that 10% cap rate. I'm not sure it's a real number. The numbers that we're hearing in urban areas have fives, fours, and sixes. Bless you. Uh, who knows? With, with, with the exception of those sovereign uh, wealth funds that are trying to place money for capital preservation, you just can't fathom that they go much lower. And then multifamily, it's it's just crazy. Uh, these guys know more about this than I do, but it's uh, it seems like all the different areas are going up in the same kind of comment on cap rates. So the population is growing up. Mm -hmm. with, with 330 million in the country, going to 400 million, they all have to have a place to live. Hopefully they're employed. <laughs> if you don't need an office, you don't have a if you don't have a job, you don't need an office. So, but it, generally it's just positive. Well, I want to thank Mike, Eli, Jim, and thank Jeff. You. Thank You're you welcome. very much. Audience, thank you very much.